Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Rising. We do have an excellent show for you today, but let's go ahead. We've got a, a busy one this morning, so we're going to dive right on in into the latest on Ukraine. Uh, over the weekend, a U.S. journalist was shot and killed at another wounded in a suburb of Kiev, according to reports. Ukrainian officials were quick to blame Russian forces for the shooting, but the exact circumstances are still unknown. The U.S. is consulting with Kiev to determine how this happened. Meanwhile, Russia and Ukraine are holding peace negotiations today in an effort to secure a ceasefire, according to an official taking part in the talks. This comes after Zelensky called on President Biden to double down on Russian sanctions over the weekend. And the U.S. is now warning that Russia may use chemical weapons against Ukraine. But Pentagon Press Secretary John Kirby said there's no evidence of it happening anytime soon. And, and give us the big picture here, John. I know we've heard a lot about possible chemical, biological attacks and that the Russians were staging this false flag trying to say Ukraine is going to do an attack. What can you tell us more about that and how likely is that? How concerned are you this morning? Well, I want to be careful we don't get into intelligence assessments here. We continue to watch this very, very closely. It is of the Russian playbook that that which they accuse you of, they're planning to do. Now, again, we haven't seen anything indi that indicates some sort of imminent chemi chemical or biological attack right now, but we're watching this very, very closely. With us now to discuss is journalist Glenn Greenwald. Glenn, thanks for being with us. Good to be with you guys. Thanks for having me. So what do you make, you know, of the situation right now? I think we're hearing a lot of different information about the, about the potential chemical attacks, and I, I think people reasonably shouldn't trust, you know, what they're hearing from Russian authorities, but then there's also a lot of automatic trust by some members of our media in what we hear from our government, from the Ukrainian government, and probably some, you know, distrust. It's a confusing war situation is merited, you know, all the way around on every side of this, but what do you make of it? So there are things we know and things we don't know. For weeks, the Russians and the Chinese have been alleging that the U.S. has been working with the Ukrainians to create bioweapons labs that can be very dangerous, that have very dangerous pathogens. Most people, at least that I know, including myself, paid little attention to that because they were just claims without evidence from the Russian and Chinese governments that obviously deserve a great amount of skepticism and shouldn't be believed absent evidence, which was lacking. The issue really became... Uh, a significant issue when Victoria Nuland, who is the Under Secretary of State and has been basically running Ukraine for the United States since at least Hillary Clinton's State Department, went before the Senate and was asked by Marco Rubio, I'm sure you guys have covered it, does Ukraine have biological and chemical weapons programs? And she didn't say no. She referred to these research facilities, biological research facilities, which she said are so dangerous, she's worried they're going to fall into Russian hands. This is what we know for sure, that they do have, Ukraine does, biological research facilities that contain seriously dangerous pathogens that can easily be weaponized if they're not already. This is what Tulsi Gabbard was talking about yesterday when she raised the concern by saying, we know for certain there are these labs in Ukraine that have these dangerous pathogens and haven't been secured and was criticizing the U.S. and Ukrainian governments for not having secured them in light of the Russian invasion. And she was widely called a traitor, including by Mitt Romney and many other members of the media for having done so. And I think, Robbie, you touched on the key point, which is that we are at the point which we always arrive at in war, where most members of the corporate media simply take U.S. government assertions or denials and treat them as unquestioned truth. And I've been, quote unquote, fact checking these concerns as false based on nothing more than what the U.S. government has been telling them, and that's always dangerous. I don't know how many times we have to learn that lesson. And there was an interesting exchange between uh, Sean Hannity and well, I think Jennifer Griffin at Fox News where she kind of pushed back on him and said, no, 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 Sean, what, you're, you're misunderstanding what Victoria Nuland said. What, what she means is that we are winding down kind of Soviet-era labs f from the 2000s. Uh, and but what I don't quite get is why they would, why that takes 15 or 20 years. So have you, have you looked into that further, this, this pushback to Victoria Nuland's testimony that actually these are just Soviet era labs that we're winding down and cleaning up? Is there anything to that? What, what, what do we know about the research that's being done? So it, just let's use common sense for a moment. Aside from the intuitively absurd notion 
that it would take 15 to 20 years for the United States with all of its resources and all of its dedication to shut down some Soviet era labs. 15 years it would take to secure and shut down those labs. That seems highly improbable. The more important point, though, is that it doesn't square. You can't reconcile it, that claim of the U.S. government that Jennifer Griffin dutifully mimicked with what Victoria Newland said, because if they're Soviet era weapons programs, and there are Soviet era chemical and biological weapons programs in these former Soviet republics that the United States has been trying to secure, that is true. Why would you be concerned that they would fall into the hands of Russia if they were Soviet era programs? It stands to reason, doesn't it, that Russia, the capital of the Soviet Union, the kind of command and control base of it, would already have those materials. You wouldn't need to worry about them falling into the hands. What is happening here is clear to me, Ryan, which is the United States plays this semantic game, which is they absolutely do develop biological and chemical weapons. We know that for sure. The FBI says the anthrax attacks in 2001, which remember were highly sophisticated weaponized strains of anthrax, came from a U.S. Army lab part of the infectious disease complex in the United States that a U.S. Army scientist unleashed on U.S. soil. We know that the U.S. government, based on reporting by your news outlet, also was helping to fund in China experiments to make the various coronaviruses more lethal and more contagious. These are biological weapons. The argument, though, of the U.S. government is, no, as long as we're developing these weapons for the purpose of studying them and developing vaccines for them, They don't count as weapons. They only become biological weapons when your intention is to use them offensively. But they're still the same thing. So even by the U.S. government's own acknowledgement of what's in Ukraine, and you can look at Reuters articles about the World Health Organization saying the U.S. has been funding various programs like this in Ukraine. When they say they're not biological weapons programs, they're just playing that semantic game. Clearly, they're concerned, they say, that the materials are going to fall into Russian hands and the Russians can weaponize them, which is that same semantic uh, game that they play always when it comes to the question of biological weapons. So, Glenn, how much of the, uh, the going back to the journalist that was killed and also the, um, the, the claims that Russia is going to potentially be unleashing chemical weapons, how much of this do you think is actual evidence that this was, you know, you know Russians did the, these terrible things and Russians are going to be doing these terrible things? Or how much of it do you think is potentially false flag to try to bait us into emotionally wanting to go into war? I, you know, I don't know who killed that journalist and wounded the other one. The claim definitively being made is that it was the Russians who killed them. Maybe the Russians did. I haven't seen any evidence for that. It's certainly possible, but not at all proven. And I think the broader point is the one that you raised, which is if you look at the vast majority of news articles about Ukraine, just go to the New York Times front page. This is something I noticed when I first began writing about politics is this format that always gets used, especially in moments like these, is the headline will be X, Y, and Z happen, comma, officials say. And then the body of the article beginning in the first paragraph is A, B, and C took place, officials tell the New York Times. And when we're in wartime or in any other kinds of crisis, including things like COVID or anything else like that, this practice becomes even more pervasive where automatically whatever claims the U.S. government tells these journalists gets treated as truth, forms the basis of these media outlets telling people what's happening, And you can't question it or in any way investigate it because if you do, it means you're a Russian propagandist because you're disbelieving the claims of the U.S. government. And this is what I think is the most odious thing right now when it comes to media coverage of the war. Yeah, well, uh, speaking of very odd claims by former U.S. government officials, last week the Rachel Maddow Show, uh, the blog, tweeted out that Hitler, quote, didn't kill ethnic Germans and claimed that Putin slaughtered the people he has come to liberate. They corrected themselves in response, saying Hitler killed millions of Germans. We tweeted out an inaccurate statement made by a guest on the show without attribution. That was former ambassador, I believe, uh, McFall. Glenn, you pointed out that the whitewashing of Hitler's crimes is a logical next step, considering Facebook's encouragement of actual neo-Nazi militia members uh, fighting Russia. So I just thought this was a kind of unintentionally hilarious moment where they're, they're 
you know, it, it, after you know, years of comparing everything to Hitler, everything is Nazis, and you know, this is a situation that actually calls for, you know, what, it, it, like, frankly, a little bit of nuance <laughs> uh, with respect to like the Nazi question, and all of a sudden, it's just a totally different narrative you hear from the mainstream media. Yeah, I mean. Look, it is definitely the case that it's wrong to claim that the majority of Ukrainians or the majority of the Ukrainian government is composed of neo-Nazis. But you can go back for the last decade and see the most mainstream news outlets in the West warning that neo-Nazi militias and ultranationalist groups with ties to notorious World War II Nazi sympathizers, they have pictures of them on the wall, they declare them national heroes, are a serious force inside Ukraine. And obviously in, in war, even though they're not the majority or anything close, it's just like what we saw in Syria. You know, the Syria revolution against Assad began with ordinary Syrians fighting back and going into the streets. But when the war really got, you know, intense, it was the most extremist fighters, Al Qaeda and ISIS and the like, that took center stage and stepped up and 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 did most of the fighting. And the arms that we sent to Syria ended up in the hands of ISIS and Al Qaeda. It stands to reason that a lot of the arms, at least if not most of them, that were flooding Ukraine with are going to end up in the hands of these most extremist forces that happen to be neo-Nazis. You know, this the most amazing thing is there's this reporter from the quote unquote Kiev Independent, which is funded by various Western interests, Ilya uh, Ponomarenko, who's become, you know, probably the most celebrated Western celebrity when it comes to Ukraine. And you can go onto his Twitter feed. It's still there where he proclaims his affinity and, 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 and loyalty to the Azov Battalion, calling them his brothers in arms. And no one wants to hear that so much of these neo-Nazi factions inside Ukraine, though a minority, are still forming a lot of the messaging coming out of Ukraine and more importantly, are a major part of the fighting force in Ukraine that we're arming and funding, supporting and celebrating. Yeah, and from what I understand, they're also hiding amongst the civilians, fighting amongst the civilians, making things much more difficult for civilians in Ukraine. Um, there's been a lot of video of them, uh, of, of civilians confronting them saying, why are you setting up here? Go, you're, you know, you're making it dangerous for us because then they target you. So, but that's, you know, war is a terrible, terrible thing. And, and Glenn, at the same time, uh, I, I wanted to uh, lift up something where you, you've been in agreement, actually, with uh, President Zelensky. Zelensky, you know, according to Reuters recently, was saying that the U.S. has not been taking negotiations and, and diplomacy seriously enough, that they're not empowering Ukraine in, to kind of find a settlement uh, to negotiate their way toward a peaceful resolution uh, to this invasion, and kind of suggesting that the that the U.S. and it, and it's he wants more sanctions now, but he also wants the ability to negotiate those sanctions away, you know, at the table with Russians. Uh, you know, if if the U.S. had you know as much forewarning as it did that this invasion invasion was going to happen and diplomatically were unable to stop it, what do, what do you what's your understanding of diplomatically? You know, what the U.S.'s posture is right now. Do you think Zelensky's right that the U.S. is not serious enough about negotiating a way, a quick end to this before it spirals even further out of control? I, I do. I mean, the difference in interest is obvious. If you're Zelensky, if you're a Ukrainian, you want an end to the war, an honorable end where you don't just give the Russians everything they want and re re reward their aggression. But you want an end to the war. People are dying all around you. Your country's being destroyed. If you're the United States, though, that's not your country, Ukraine. What you want is you like seeing the Russians completely isolated out of Western Europe. You like seeing the Nord Stream 2 uh, pipeline finally destroyed so that the Europeans are forced instead to buy natural gas from the United States. We've seen both in Syria and Afghanistan how the United States loves to lure Russia into prolonged protracted insurgency wars where we arm the insurgency just enough to keep the war going, but not enough for the for the insurgents to win so that the war keeps going. And this is a thing, Ryan, you know, that I keep getting back to. It's like when we talk about the role of NATO expansion and what the U.S. or NATO might have done to, to provoke, it's not about trying to switch blame. The blame lies with the, the aggressor, the invader. The point is to explore ways to bring about a diplomatic resolution to the end of this war. And there seems to be very little interest in doing that. You can go back to the first and the second day of the war 
where Zelensky wanted to have direct talks with Russian officials. And you can find in the Washington Post and the New York Times them making clear that the position of the U.S. government was those talks shouldn't be held both because they're futile and because it will reward Russian aggression. So I don't know what's in the minds of the U.S. government. It's too big of an entity to talk about one motive. That's always what happened whenever someone would say, why did the U.S. attack Iraq? As if you could isolate one person or one motive. But the actions of the U.S. government seem very clearly to reflect a lack of interest in diplomatically ending this war, if not the opposite, which is an affirmative desire for it not to end at least yet. Hmm. Well, Glenn, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Great to be with you guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Stay around. We'll tell you what's on our radars in just a minute.